Good. I just finished up the permit. Oh, you're the man. I'll share. I can screen share. Sorry, I just got it done just now. Sorry. <laughs> you were supposed to go home and I'd still be there. It wouldn't have gotten done if I didn't stay. <laughs> Did Mr. Dwyer, that looked pretty good, the um, application, the checklist and that we had done? Yes. Yeah, I took a look at it first thing, and um, I did get back the one little tweak that we did um, Tuesday night was to uh, add in language about riverfront property. So, um, but that, that'll be pretty obvious. You get your plot plan, you'll see if they have riverfront property or not. Okay. I did have some amendments to it too, as well, Tommy. Um, I created a, an official use section. I'll, I can show you once we get started, but okay, so that you can you can check off as the uh, floodplain administrator that when you receive the document. Great. You're gonna have to get a different badge for each of these hats you wear. <laughs> Building inspector, all, all zoning us. enforcement officer. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe just a different hat. There you go. <laughs> Did you have a lot of people at the meeting on uh, Tuesday night? Not a huge number. Uh, uh, maybe five or six. Okay. Some of the usual... Uh, I mean, we probably can wrap it up if, you know, everybody puts their input on the committee, if there's any changes or whatever, just know what we need to change and probably wrap this up tonight, right? I mean. Yeah, I think so. Everybody seemed fairly uh, satisfied with the version we had, uh, we discussed last night. Um, it does allow multiples, but uh, at your discretion, provided the lot can support it. How you doing? Doing good. Glad Janice sent me a notice because I never would have seen it. <laughs> what are we doing? I, I'm glad Bill reminded me because we were busy moving our <laughs> office. It's six o'clock. You think we should get going? Wait uh, a little bit. Maybe give uh, give people a couple of minutes more. Um, Bill, are you going to go over what the final, like, or what your board has kind of come to? Oh, uh, yes, I could do that. And I have been sending those around, but I'm not sure uh, everyone has the latest draft. Is that the one with the um, yellow highlighting for the different sections that's reformatted? Uh, that's the application. I was talking okay. about the, um, uh, the actual zoning bylaw section. Okay. I know I copied you on it, but I'll, uh, you want to start with, well, do we want to, I suppose we could get started. It's, I'm showing 602. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. do you want me to put up, start by putting up that, um, that piece? That sounds like a that perfect start. Yep. Let's see.
Yeah, let's see if that looks like I'm going, to try, I'm going to try that again. How does that look? Beautiful. You can see that. OK. So this is what we have come up with, I, I think, our final draft. And I've sent but around to most of you were asked Didi to send it. Uh, not a big change up here in uh, the first section, although um, our um, Ken Comey from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission tells us that VE and V zones are coastal flooding zones. And so we'll probably just delete those because we don't have a problem with that. Uh, so we do have a statement that recreational vehicles are permitted in the floodplain on lots with Connecticut River frontage with the approval of the community floodplain administrator. Uh, one, one RV on any lot, as long as it meets minimum size. Uh, more than one if the lot can specify, can provide a minimum spacing of 25 feet between RVs, uh, a minimum spacing of 25 feet from RVs on abutting lots, if at all possible, that may not always be possible, and a minimum of 2,500 square feet of area for each RV. And if three or more proposed um, demonstrate compliance with the uh, standards, the uh, sanitary code standards for the family type campgrounds. The rest of it hasn't, that's sort of the broad structure there. Um, uh, and these are guidance basically for Tom as the flood, community floodplain administrator. No danger of pollution to, uh, by the location, utilities, to minimize flood damage, adequate methods for periodic disposal of waste, and a statement, because I guess it doesn't go without saying that uh, uh, this bylaw does not excuse, this zoning bylaw does not excuse compliance with any other applicable law. So that will be section seven, and I, the, the larger bylaw is one that uh, the mass emergency management is asking all towns with uh, uh, floodplain issues to update their bylaws to conform to the FEMA. So the rest of it is basically straight out of the model bylaw that's proposed. This was our only different section. So this is really what we're talking about and what had the most interest. So any questions on any of that? I have no, a I think it's, oh, Go ahead, Janice. Oh, I, I want you guys to go first. I just couldn't see if anyone was going to talk or not. Go ahead. Well, no, I, my only comment was I'm happy that you have that it has to comply with the other laws, applicable wetland protection laws under the jurisdiction of the commission. So that would be the river. Um, river protection. So yep. that's my only comment. Well, um, it, it, it's something that we, it should go without saying because you have a different statutory basis for your authority, but, um, but apparently it's better to say it than to not say it. Yes. And, uh, Mark Dunn has his hand raised. I didn't want to speak out of turn. Um, the one question I had, Bill, was you, you said, and I noticed you said that the other night, they may not be able to maintain 25 feet between a uh, RV on my parcel and an RV on my neighbor's parcel. Don't we, do we want to allow that? Would the, you know, for fire safety or anything like that, if there's a fire, don't we want to keep that? Well, some of those lots are really narrow as we had discussed. Right. And um, 
but wouldn't that, I mean, couldn't they still do that by moving one further from the river? Perhaps. What we want to be careful of is not, so one person may not be able to, if the lot's only 40 feet wide, he may not be able to maintain 25 foot uh, separation from his neighbors. Um, so we don't want to say that they can't, if they have a narrow lot, they, that they can't have one. Right. Um, and, well, wouldn't yeah. that be saying that they could stack them going away from the ri river? But do you feel like that's an undue hardship? Well, a, you know, partly it's a question of where's the where's the best space on the lot, all things considered. And it might be that the person who wants to put two is going to have to stack theirs, so the person who has a narrow lot can keep theirs. It may come to a first come first mm -hmm. serve. Uh, land rush, but uh, I don't know if it'll even be a problem, but that's why I put in, if at all possible, because I know that that might be an issue for some lots down there. Yeah. Bill, yeah, will I mean, there I, be a minimum setback from a property line under zoning, or will you propose something like that? It, it, it's not a, it's not a uh, permit structure, and even if it was an accessory um, structure, it could be 15 feet. So okay, that, well, I guess that's what I'm asking. Yep. Is there going to be, is the planning board going to put a, under their table of use, put a setback no. on there from the we property? Weren't, we weren't planning on doing that. The uh, we're just giving basic guidance to the uh, building inspector for hand for handling this, but. Um, when I'm not looking at specific setbacks. Okay. I don't think it's gonna matter for everything down there. It might matter more on some, but Tom can handle that on a case by case basis because he'll have all the information from you and from your abutter. And he can say, look, you can't maintain 25 feet of separation. If you put it here, you have to put it back further or, mm -hmm. or we'll see. Um, if it and turns that out to, that in permit. Yeah, if, if it turns out to be something that is problematic, we can look at uh, uh, amending the dimensional tables at a later date. But um, I'm just trying to keep it simple here. Right. And Janice has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, so my first question was, and I just didn't have time to look this up, but um, those first couple of different flood zones, the A130, AH, AE, and V130, are some, I don't know the difference between those. Is one of them the floodway? Or is none of those the floodway? Or do you know offhand? I don't know offhand. I think it is in the main part of the bylaw. Um, or it is on the flood map. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the A130, AH, and AE are on the flood maps, if I recall. Okay, I don't have them with me here. Okay, I was just, your intention, Bill, is to allow or not allow um, any campers within that floodway. The Hadley floodway, I should say. At the moment, once we realized how complex it all was getting, we're allowing campers on lots down there, but um, not making a distinction. We're no longer making a distinction between floodway and floodplain. Okay. As long as, as long as they can be driven out immediately, right? Yes. Okay, and then I had one other question too, which maybe you're going to get to anyway. Um, we are starting to get some uh, people wanting to do their permits, and uh, I guess I just looked at my emails, and there's someone who has submitted um, a permit or two already. So how will that work? It's sort of we'll do our part, the conservation commission. If they get approval for from us, how soon is this going to be in effect? I assume it really won't happen until after June or July, right? So how's that middle ground going to get covered? Ah, well, there is a solution to that. Oh, excellent. Um, 
let me see, have I, I'm gonna stop sharing at this point. And uh, Jim probably has uh, maybe a better explanation than uh, I do, but um, zoning bylaws become effective upon, uh, they relate back to the date of the original publication of the legal notice of the public hearing on the zoning articles. Okay. So um, assuming we can get that in around, when do you think, Jim? Can we get the um, legal uh, notice published relatively soon? I think we know everything we're gonna have. We can get, probably get it published by some, well, when do we want I mean, we can publish probably by sometime in early April if we want. Okay. I just looked up on our, I just looked up on our zoning bylaw in section 13. The only zones we have are A1 and A130. Okay. Um, and let me see if, um, take a look at the flood map and see what that shows. Um, That's exactly what the, 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 the wording, exact wording is under 13.2, the flood overlay district is here and established as an overlay district and includes all special flood hazard areas designated as zone A, I'm sorry, zone A and A130 on the Hadley flood insurance rate maps, dated June 1, 1978. So, so we have zone A and zone A130. Okay. And um, I'm looking at the map itself and there's a zone A12 on that. And a zone A13. Ah. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that you were also working on um, approving revised flood maps, aren't you? Is that part of the new mapping? Maybe no, they're not ready yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Then we have another definition. No, sorry, Bill. Under definitions, we have the area may be designated as Zone A, comma, A O, comma, A H, comma, A one dash thirty, comma, A E comma, A99, comma, and v, V1-30, comma, VE, comma, or V. So we have a bunch of things there. So we're going to find out what we need to, how we need to do, how we need to use it under the first section. Okay. Okay, so V, VE, V1-, V30 are all coastal. Okay. So I don't think those are us. Um, I just put in the chat the A and then the AE, A1 to A30 is in there. I just put that in the chat. And then see if I can get these other ones in here. Okay. Well, we, we can. Um... We can con we can correct those two and conform them. So anyway, where we were going with this was that a zoning, the, the effective date of a zoning bylaw relates back to the date of the first publication of the legal notice, as long as it is subsequently approved by town meeting and approved by the attorney general. So um, the, the effective, the presumptive effective date will be, you know, pick a day, call it April 1st. Uh, whenever the Gazette, whenever the first legal notice hits the Gazette. Okay. Good, thank you. Yeah, so I just put all those zones in the chat if you anybody cares, so. So, thank you. You, yeah, thank you, you. Yeah, would you be able to just send that to Dee Dee so she could send it around because the chat disappears when yep. the meeting closes. 
Yeah, I'll send her a link to the page where it is, where it's okay. located. I think that looks what you did was great there. Actually, actually, the the write up with the because um, every every situation is going to be different. So that I think if it works, we'll you know make it so that we can review every situation if it comes that close. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be. It seems to be enough to give you guidance without enough without tying your hands. Does anybody else have comments on that? Psych again <clears throat> has another question. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, and this may just be because I, I didn't have time to do my homework, but um, the the definition for recreational vehicles, what sort of things does that include? Trailers, campers, how small? Um, yeah, that is included in the, the larger bylaw. So uh -huh. let me go there. I mean, is there a size recreational vehicle camper that would not need this? Some one of those little things that people may tow behind their car, you know, the pop up sort of things. So the the definition is written as no larger than. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Let, let me. Um, and you do, do you define a camper? Well, I'll, I'll show that. you. Yeah, I'll show you the definition. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to go back in on that. Um, all right, so this was the working copy from PVPC. So excuse me while I scroll through it. Um, You've been busy. <laughs> so, um, this is the, the section 13 is the, the RVs, but the definitions are in here. And here is the definition of recreational vehicle. Single chassis, 400 square feet or less, designed to be self-propelled or permanently towable by a light duty truck and designed not, at, not for use as a permanent dwelling, but as temporary living quarters for recreation, camping, travel, or seasonal use. And that sure. is right out of the Code of Federal Regulations. That is the FEMA definition of an RV. In our existing definition bill, we have light duty truck defined. I wonder if we shouldn't do that here as well, because light duty truck, they, somebody could be thinking, well, you know, what's light duty? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's the existing one. I think it's 8,500 GBW. Okay, good. Okay, so we can update that. All right, good. Thank you. So that's the regulatory framework. Or that that is the authorizing. Uh, are any other questions about that? No, I think it looks good. And then, if not, I think I would then uh, turn it over to the chief and Tom to discuss the um, what the application is going to look like. And I have enabled screen sharing for you, Mike.
Thanks. Tommy, you want me to bring it up now or do you yeah, have Yeah, let's let's do that. Has has everybody had a chance to take a peek at it? I know we sent it out late, but well, it's been revised too. I added some stuff. I mean, but it's <laughs> right. the same, but like I said, I just finished it. So you can take a look again after. I've got the one that just got sent out. What parts were revised? Just so. Uh, I just cleaned up some stuff. Um, the official use part, I don't know if that was in there. I added some, the official use section here. Okay. Oh yeah, that was. So you have the checklist that has, um, you know, what the, what the applicant needs to submit. And then we needed a space after they sign off on it to actually track it. So um, mm -hmm. added a permit number, we needed to have a permit number. Um, and then basically it just, uh, basically this is official use only. So it's just the sign off for Tommy. Uh, and then that the fees attached, the fee, which, fee which is paid, who received it approved by and date of date that it's approved because that's your three year approval date, which mm -hmm. will need to match with the permit. Then we, yep. uh, I, when uh, Bill sent out the bylaw, I kind of just attached some sections of it. Um, out of the fee schedule, which you saw, and uh, Tommy and I had spoken with about spoken about that. I I agree. Somebody had been on was on the last meeting and had presented, you know, their that their family comes down, and um, I I agree that I believe a, a a family should be allowed to bring down, you know, their campers onto their property and not have to pay individual fees. So we kind of clean that up if everybody agrees. And then we needed a permit to be able to submit to everybody. So I kind of uh, pulled this off of our state permit that we have that we use for fire regulation. And so it's pretty simple. It just, it kind of closes the gap here with, you have your permit number. And then it just reflects that, you know, in accordance with all of these provisions of Mass General Law, and I copied Bill's section of, uh, you know, the state rules and regulations governing waterfront property in the Commonwealth. You put the name of the owner, occupant, or non-related guest. Uh, and then the permission is for them to place fully licensed and highway ready. This is pulled out of the bylaw. Um, and then restrictions, which can be amended, but I just put an example that there was one section that we have in the, um, the notes that, you know, if there are any changes occurring prior to the expiration date, that if they have to go to the Community Floodplain Administrator and Conservation Commission. Um, that this does not supersede or replace any additional required permits. Uh, and the applicant agrees to comply with the with section 13.7 seasonal uses of the town of Hadley bylaws and all applicable codes and standards. And then they just have to put in clear, we, we just put in clearly where it's located, uh, the fee paid, the expiration date, which should match the application. And then here's the signature section for, for Tom yours is for his designation. Mike, you may want to be specific where it says Hadley bylaws. You may want to say Hadley zone bylaw. Otherwise, somebody somebody may be looking for that in the general bylaw. That's all. Okay. And do you define immediate family? And is there a place to put down? Is that would that be one trailer per immediate family? No. Base basically, if if the family, if they were related. They would only pay the one the one fee. They still have to meet the you know the criteria for the additional trailers. But if they were related, then they would only pay the the one hundred if they were all related. And what what defines? But immediate family has a specific definition, like mother, father, sister, brother, not grandchildren, um, great grandchildren, grand aunts, you know, stuff like that. That's my. And who's are you going to determine? Um, who the family is, who constitutes family? Well, the folks are signing, you know, there's a section here for them to put RV owner information and they're, they're signing mm -hmm. off on here and attesting that under the penalties of perjury. So, I mean, if, if we get okay. that there's 15 things down there and I mean, we could, we could take out immediate family and just put owner and family, but mm -hmm. um, right. I don't well, know if we have to 
that's all and it, it's just a matter of okay who's going to verify i know you're saying they have to attest to it who's going to verify that they are related that's going to be on top we maybe need to make the put the definition what immediate family i understand i see what you're saying because we're all related <laughs> right I, I i see that point and if you open it up to cousins it gets to be a big a big bowl yeah but they're still limited on because they're going to be putting your site plan together so they're still limited on the number of spaces that they would be able to use right but if i say well my cousins like my brother you know that i consider them immediate family so they're going to come down and put the trailer on my property does that constitute immediate family? Because under many different laws, immediate family is defined. Just asking. No, that's fine. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> well, no, I'm I'm trying to relieve Tommy of extra work to try and figure out, you know, who's who or what's what and whether or not they're renting to someone who might be a relative and well, yeah, they're immediate family, but you know, and it will apply if it's immediate family and there's more than three campers, they have to comply with the Board of Health campground requirements, correct? Tommy. Tommy. Go, go ahead. One of the things I think if you start nitpicking this too much, you're going to be opening up a can of worms trying to do a definition. Right. And I was just going to ask Mr. Dwyer that. That. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't get inside. I wouldn't get too involved in it because you're going to open yourself up because what if it's a stepbrother, stepsister, or grandson, granddaughter? I mean, if you just limit it to brothers and sisters or mothers and fathers and children, I mean, grandchildren should be able to be allowed. I know a lot of the campgrounds do have, you know, the grandfather owns the place and their grandkids come. So. Right. It, but that's the question. Where do you cut it off? And. And, and I think that'll be in Tommy's discretion idea, when they do the permit in the site plan of what's well, even allowed on the space. At, you can't do it at someone's discretion. You it's going to be at the building department's the discretion. He's, he does right, the permit. But you get it. If Tommy leaves or decides to retire, he hits the lottery and leaves and somebody else comes in and they've got a completely different attitude about it. I mean, we're here in this situation because there was no enforcement previously. But uh, Paula, that's also true with anything. I mean, Tommy being a building inspector can go into a, a construction project and deem one thing different than another building inspector does. Right, but the, if it's going to be specific as in like immediate family, immediate family is defined in many places under various laws. So that's what, and, Hello. and the idea, and Johnny, just so you know, the idea between, behind the $100 fee is to account for the time and effort it takes to review and permit and maybe inspect these properties. That's, that's the idea behind the fee, is to account for the person's time and energy and effort. Not right, and in the, in the most fee that they can get is $300, because you can only do three campers. No. It, uh, after that's a campground, and then has to go through a different permitting process. Well, no, you just have to get an additional permit from the Board of Health, is okay. my understanding. I would suggest you keep it family, and I wouldn't keep it immediate family. That's my suggestion. I think, no, I think we need to define what constitutes family. So, so maybe we just need to find out how big an issue this is. So uh, Mike, could you scroll up Mike, on the form? Yeah, uh, yeah, I said she's getting too curious. And where you have the... Uh, if you could add a line for relationship to property owner. 
That's a great section. idea. Yep. And then um, we'll, we'll gather some data on how big an issue this is. Okay. Hey, where Paul. did you where do you want this, Bill? Uh, you know, maybe uh, after is the RV registered insured? Uh, oh, or maybe after RV owner's name, maybe. Yeah. Uh, relationship. Yeah. Just oh, have yeah. Uh, you know owner's name slash relationship, and then um, yeah. there's the they'll put down their name and their relationship to the property owner. And now there's more room to fill stuff in. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they put it as long as they do something like uncle, son, grand, granddaughter, you know, what have you. Uh, That's relationship to property owner. Yeah, relationship to property owner. Hello, Bill. Okay, let's see. Someone just chimed in, but Janice does have her hand up. So uh, go to her first. And then I think it was Kevin who. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have the hand. Remember okay, the last time. Let's, let's get Janice with her hand up first and then. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, so there's no limit on the number, well, let's say so. I was wondering whether from our discussions previously that the family might just be the the owner and one family member at a time because I thought people were more talking about sequence and that someone may come for two weekends someone else may come in the month that sort of thing so I I, I had thought that that was going to be the way it was more that it was you know um, maybe an exchange, but it might just be one other family member. But conceivably, this could be many different campers, recreation vehicles on the same site, right? It's because a lot of times they are family, whether they're brothers and sisters and in-laws and parents and, and everything. But does that, I guess, does that make a difference if in the end we're limiting the number of spaces? It's just a matter of whether you're collecting additional fees or not, I suppose. I'm, I'm just wondering. That was the theory, you know, if you if it's a family and it's all family members there, it's just to be, to, you know, if you have three campers to be $300 and, and a family members, we just didn't think it was, was fair. Uh-huh, okay. Um, but I mean, that's all open for discussion. That's just, was, you know, Chief and I, we were, were thinking that I know everybody else's opinion on that. So one thing that is different from this discussion than discussing, uh, zoning bylaws or wetland regulations is that this application is entirely under Tom's authority as the uh, floodplain manager. And he has authority to adopt regulations uh, or procedures. So this can be changed easily if if after we get a year of experience here, it is uh, we're getting an impression that some people are taking advantage. Um, the um, going forward, it it can be changed. It'll still be good for the three years, but whoever shows us a new trick this summer may get away with it for a couple of years, but. Uh, by this time next year, Tom will have updated the application. So um, I think there's, so, uh, you know, we correct. have some fallback positions here. Yeah, Mark put something in chat, being a devil's advocate, which triggered something in my mind. Um, you know, family reunion, people go down there, you have a permit for a certain number of campers. Is that going to allow tent camping in addition to the trailers. So if you have like three trailers and then you got a whole gang coming down and you got five tents, you know, for a week or a couple of weeks or stuff like that. Just to, just throwing that out there. Right. See, I, I didn't think as far as you, you're going to have people on the 4th of July that have, you know, family members that come down with tents and 
they you know camp on the back of the yard but we have a contact as far as the life safety we have the contact of the actual camper and all that that they're visiting so uh, you know i i just don't think that would be be a problem you know just be on a weekend they wouldn't you know wouldn't have their family members outside that tent all summer i wouldn't think can i say something um i mean basically the whole purpose of this was more for us to get the information in case of an emergency um and by them uh, you know the property owners signing this document it, they're signing it and we're taking their word i mean the building department is extremely busy and for mm -hmm. us to then i mean if somebody says it's their brother i mean okay it's their brother i mean we're going to believe them i mean we can't start, I mean, are we supposed to check their license, birth certificates? I mean, no. that's to the point, though, that I feel our more thing was to get this to be for the families to be able to enjoy it and to make sure that we had everybody's information properly on there. Something happens down the road and they go against any of, any of the things, then they you know, lied on their application, and then there would be consequences. But that's just how I feel. I mean, because this is basically the whole reason why we were doing this. Right. And the other purpose is because people haven't been going through the Conservation Commission. So, correct. But what does that have to do with the. Yep. It we'll would be in violation of their permit. Well, right, but what does that have to do with them being a family member or otherwise? I mean, that's getting, I'm sorry, to me, that's getting a little too technical for that part, but that's me. Well, no, my, my question was, if you're going to just say, okay, $100 per property, everyone's going to be related versus $100 per camper, whether or not, you know, you've got people coming and going. I mean, right, but we don't want, it's not to make money, it's just to, for the life safety to know where everything is. Um, and, and like, you know, Mike had said as well, they're signing everything's true and accurate and, and there's not too many people that are, you know, they're gonna say something after si signing that that isn't true. <clears throat> so okay. I know that Kevin O'Brien had a question and then there are a couple of other hands up. So, oh, um, Phil, I mean, I'm, I'm reading this myself, you know, with the family owner. Is there a way that, that you guys could just come up with, like, a, a number of trailers per family? Like, you know, say, like, a, just say, you know, the owner is allotted four trailers for the $100, and, he, and every um, additional trailer after that is a $100 fee or something that basically takes that out of it, be, you know? It's just kind of simple and just kind of general, or does it have to be more concrete? I mean, that makes sense if it's $100 per, for up to X number of trailers, and then additional fee over that. My thought. I think uh, Mark Britton had his hand up. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Hey, I just, on, on this whole permitting fee, I might have uh, jumped on a little too late, so I might have to be, I might, might not make any sense to you guys. But um, with the permit fees with the campers on the properties, so I did the math on my property, and as long as I can get through Conservation Commission, um, I mean, I could have like seven campers on my property. It's, I, there's no way I would do that. Um, I have four on there right now, which hopefully uh, that, that passes, but I'm going to try to get a fifth permit. Instead of having the camper fees per camper, would it be smarter to have the camper fees per spot? So uh, like my neighbor Dennis has, you know, four campers there. And, and if he decides that, you know, family are coming up or whatever he can buy a fifth spot for the season so there's that just fifth spot and then you know you have the contact information the emergency contact of, of the landowner and um, you know you could just instead of getting you know detailed into brothers cousins sisters husbands what I mean it just seems like that's just 
we're, we're, we're trying to look for streamlined procedures and it doesn't seem like anything that you guys were speaking about is, is, is even coming close to being streamlined. Well, well, this was just to try to save the families. Um, you know, we thought if you, you know, if it's all related, why, why would you have to pay $400 for four campers when it's, you're all related to just be the hundred. That's all we we're trying to do is save, save on the families. And, and I understand that, Tommy, and, and I would say 75% of the property owners down there that have campers, um, we're, we're willing to work with the town when it comes to the fees, um, and $100 per camper isn't that bad. You're going to have a couple of people complain about that, but the, the other thing, the other feeling I'm getting is I feel like some people in the town think that we're like derelicts and criminals, and, and we're going to be sneaky, and we're going to throw in a bunch of extra campers and, and party down there. And that's not the case. It's, it's, it's a small group compared to the size of the river and the towns and the communities out there. I mean, and, and nothing, I, I honestly don't think anything is going to change. And I think it's a huge workload on you, Tommy, to, to police this. And I think you have a, you have a understanding of who's down there right now and what's going on. And I, I just think that everybody's just going a little overboard on, um, you know, talking about all these nitpicking type type uh, issues. And uh, Mark Dunn had his hand up. Yeah, I just, um, I had some thoughts earlier. I don't know if they've already been addressed or not. One was when we talked about the tents, um, you know, I haven't been following this issue for years so i don't know but my sense was one of the more important things was liability as we have global warming and we have more severe weather and we're getting more flooding i i remember hearing concern about campers getting washed down the river um, so controlling the number of campers was what i was focused on so that we don't get campers when we have a bad flood um, damaging dams down the river or, you know, it's assumed that if you're in a tent, you can, you're able-bodied enough to, to get out of the way before the river floods. So that was the, the one thing I was gonna say. And then the other thing kind of going to, to Didi's point uh, about not going overkill with, you know, affidavits and stuff on, and birth certificates is if we have a line on the permit where they sign that it says under this, you know, I attest that everything above is true. And if not, I render the town harmless. You know, I can't sue the town for being negligent if I've been untruthful on my permit. Those are my thoughts. So Jim raised a point, uh, which I'll let him mention. He just texted me a question. Sure, big. I'm not the attorney. I asked the attorney <laughs> it's the a, question. It's a good point. The uh, I asked the question: Is it legal to ask relationship on an application? Right. That's a very good question. Yep. Correct. I very. I doubt it. Right. So, and that's so what I'm trying to get across: is that I mean, we're just trying to make this. It's yeah. a one-time thing. Uh, every three years unless somebody else gets added and it's just more for our safety purpose that's what really it's all about and if somebody wants to lie then that's their problem and down the line they could get in trouble and get caught but um, we don't have I, I mean I don't know how somebody's going to prove to us whether it's their brother or sister or or things like that I mean and, and we don't have time for that so let's get let's just take that out. Uh, let's let's do something like a uh, hundred dollars for the first two campsites and a hundred dollars for every additional campsite. That sounds fine with me. How does everybody else agree on that? Feel yeah, on I mean, that? You, you, I, I think you got a starting point here, and if we try to design the thing for every conceivable right. something, we're going to end up with a disaster. Let's see how it works with. What you what you know with the basics, and it can always be revised next year. Yep. So, I, I my opinion, 
is, you know, this wasn't about fees. Again, as Dee said, this was about just life safety. And again, we're not, I'm not, I purposely, I mean, the information that's being requested, um, it was strictly in the event that if the property owner's not on site and not available because they don't always pick up, I mean, we can, I can give you many uh, instances where just overnight at somebody's house, we don't have contact or at a business. Um, this information was meant to share in the event that something happens. So I know folks say, you know, we do usually have, uh, we have a lot of time before we have a flooding event. But as, a, as an emergency manager and as a fire chief, I have to plan for the worst. And we have had instances where the river has come up uh, extremely quickly in a matter of a couple hours. And I know that you know, it was mostly boats and, and somebody's storage that they had at their house. Um, but I mean, we, we do have, we do have a number of dams plans in them. Um, so the purpose of this was to be able to get you guys to sign up on this Nixle site that's on here, just so we can get you information up front. We have tornadoes that come through. We have, um, you know, we have some pretty serious weather that comes through very quickly. We also have, if everybody's using propane down there, Couple summers ago, at a campsite, we had uh, the propane company not complying with fire regulation, and they had multiple tanks tanks blow up because they hadn't been inspected properly, and it damaged a lot of campers, and it damaged it actually almost burned the guy who was filling the tanks up. So it's more just to get you guys information and to actually be able to get to you in the event of an emergency. That was the purpose of this, in my opinion. I understand that there's conservation. Uh, requirements as well. Um, I'm happy to amend however you want to do the owner information, um, but that was the the original purpose of it. So let's just take out relationship. To try to get them to commit to relationship is just, mm -hmm. it is, right. you know. Exactly. It's basically a good so, idea, but we, you know, may not be the right thing to do. No, so immediate and, family should be removed then you don't deal with that issue. And if you do the $100 for the first two campers, $100 after that, something like that. I mean, it's, if or you're gonna be camping there all summer, that's cheaper than pulling into a campground somewhere. I would say $100 for so, a site. And like, uh, I, I don't know if it was Mark or, um, I'm not sure who said it. We did 100 per site and then $100 for each additional over five or four. Um, again, I was just, one of the family members said that he has four family members come down every summer, you know, his, his daughters and his sons. And I don't know, to me, it just seems, again, this isn't, this wasn't intended to be a fee catcher. It was intended to be, uh, getting information and getting, get, you know, being able to have a safe area down there. So, and, I, and I think that's reasonable. You can't get a hotel room nowadays for a hundred dollars a night. So, hundred dollars for three years that that's very reasonable and I think a lot of people would, would agree with that so okay just make it per site one hundred dollars does that work for you Tommy or do you want to set out do you want to have a, you want to make it so if it we could make it the three because that makes it a campsite so anything over three or what, what how do that you makes, that, that makes sense yes yeah do that then because then it wouldn't trigger a campsite if it, if it was unrelated, so. So basically, while Mike's doing that, um, that was one of the things that we had changed from, from last week on his on the layout he had done in here. Another thing that we had added was the um, 190 days. And I, Mr. Dwyer, that sounded fine to you, number two. Um, on the on the notes, on the notes number no, I two, it was like one seventy nine. One seventy nine. Yeah, one hundred seventy nine days. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry. And then the other thing we had added, because um, I had a little concern on you know the police, not so much myself, but police not getting complaints with if the farmers were out up on a budding property, you know, spraying uh, chemicals or. or harvesting crops, whatever, at six in the morning, getting complaints and all. So we just kind of threw that in 
to protect the, the right to farm community and the farmers. Um, just because of, I had some input on that from, from uh, local people. Makes sense. All right, right. So when you I'm looking at what Mike's typing, is it for the site for the first three? Is it Two. three or more, or is it over three that becomes a campsite or a campground? It, three, three or three more. Or more. Okay. So it's so, per site for two sites or okay. for first two sites. First site, one to three RVs would be would maybe a good way to put that, Mike. Well, one to two, because three makes a campground. Right. Three or more is a campground. So they have okay. to go. One or, the first site, one, one to one or two. One to oh, two. We, I mean, we're 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 setting the fee for ourselves, not based upon the campsite. So we could do one to three, and then do anything over that would trigger. I mean, we're not. They they're still going to have to go to the board of health for their for their stuff. We were just trying to set a number for the fee. So first uh, first three sites, one hundred dollars. Three or more. Our first four. Yeah. Okay. Next line should read over three, four or more. Four or more. Four or more. Yep. Yep. And does it say somewhere in there? Because I'm not flipping through it, um, where it says that if you have three or more, it triggers a board of health permit. I believe it's up in the board of health section. Uh, That's right. I couldn't our, see it. So. Yep. We added our RV sites being rented, and then three or more constitutes a campground. All right. And so if people ask, if you're not renting, even if you have three or more, it constitutes a campground, If it's, even if it's family members. Because I know working as a planner for years, the devil's in the detail with the wording. I don't know, Bill, so, is it unrelated yeah. folks constitutes the campground? Well, or? you know, the regulation, the health regulations are a little vague. <clears throat> uh, they talk about, they talk about families and uh, more than one family or more than three families. Uh, and again, they don't define what a family is. So um, we, that's why we did it sort of on just the raw number that if you have three or more, you should, you, you should comply with the uh, sanitary code for a campground. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And if, so that's, that is in addition to the cons the Board of Health regulations, which have separate statutory authority. Um, you, as I've said a couple of times, the, the zoning aspect of this is a small part of a small piece of a bigger pie. And, um, and again, this is um, this does have flexibility. And I see Mark Dunn has his hand up. Um, earlier, Mike was talking about concerns and about how the river could come up in a matter of hours. Is there a spot on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, permit application for an emergency contact number in addition to their number? Like, let's say they, put their camper there and they're gone out of state. Is it, did, did they have a, should we ask them for an alternate number to let someone know? We have the 24 hour number. And if they sign up for the Nixle, um, that would go out in, it would hit their email, their text, their phone, whatever they signed up on there. So uh, that's why we, we had re requested that if um, somebody else was, you know, had their trailer on somebody's site and, you know, the owner wasn't there, but they were using it. That's why we're asking them to, to populate this information. Uh, it's also, you know, if, uh, you know, we have a lot of people that are coming up from, you know, the East Hampton 
uh, boat launch with, you know, that are breaking into campers and stuff like that. So it was also to be able to uh, provide this information to PD if somebody breaks into your camper because nobody's there during the week, they can get in touch with you as well. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was the purpose of having all this information here. Uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it was designed to just keep everybody in the loop, not to, um, not to try and police. Is there a follow-up, Mark? Um, no, I guess uh, the only other comment I was going to make was, you know, and again, I would defer to you, Bill. I, uh, I'm not an attorney, and I don't even play one on TV. So um, I just, I just kind of was not sure that we can't, you know, limit it to families. That just seemed kind of uh, overly cautious. I would think that there would be legal standing for saying, you know, families to protect the people who own the property, um, but just not going overboard with the enforcement. But anyway, it's, it's not my committee and we've, it sounds like we've already backed away from the whole family language. So I'll drop that. And Janice. Um, I had one more question. I really just don't know about this, but under the uh, the RVs registered and insured, do they have to be registered and insured or is that just another way to be able to track them or, or what? Yes, we, we are asking that we, we're asking that they be roadable. Okay. And they can't they can't be roadable if they're not registered and they can't be registered without being insured. So if they say no on there, then you'd have to do some follow up with them or something. Or Correct. Would. Okay. It'd be denied. You'd have okay. to be have to be registered. Okay. Thanks. If I could ask one more question, how are we doing the enforcement of three or more? Is that stuck on Tommy? Does he have to say, "Hey, did you guys go to the board of health?" Or yes. Yeah, he's the uh, he's the gateway. Yeah, so they would have to bring proof to him that they've gone before the Board of Health before a permit got issued, correct? Correct. Yeah. Well, first it's conservation. Then if they were going to yeah. go, not answer yes on one of those, you know, any of those questions like that, then it would have to go in front of a, if it was no to fire that they didn't, you know, have something they needed, then it would, you know, have to prove that before I could issue it. Okay, and if and I've missed previous meetings, are we expecting Tommy to go down there periodically and and check and see you know, gee, you've got eight, but I've only got two permits or something like that. Or what? What I think is going to happen with this is that the all these people that are on here and all the people they they want to see the the very few, but there is some sites that they're not happy with and and they want that enforced so. They're going to have all this in doing everything legally and they're going to be they're the ones going to be policing it and calling me that that's kind of my feedback and what i think is going to happen with this um you know they're they're having their septics their their tanks pumped and somebody next door isn't then they'll find out they're not registered and, and that's how we'll you know straighten that kind of thing out the few that will that will be doing that yeah and conservation commission typically does when they issue a permit they want to know when they have um, complied with the site plan that they have um, submitted. So conservation typically, Janice, me, and the other members will be going down there taking a look with the site plan to see, you know, you applied for two, you've got two, no, now you got five, well, now you're in violation of the Wetlands Act. So an enforcement order gets issued. And then we notify building and building would say, okay, you're in violation of the permit. So, which entails fees per day for vi being in violation. If it's under zoning, um, CONSCOM too. And I see Lionel DeForge has a hand raised. 
Yeah, I'm kind of confused there for the three or four trailers. Now, is it four over it considered it a campground or is it four under you're not? Board of Health was three or more, I believe, right, Mr. Dwyer? Yeah, let me uh, let me just pull up the um, uh... I mean, it says on the permit there, three or more constitutes a campground. But you said that there's some ambiguity, ambiguity with that. It accommodates for profit three or more families or camping groups, but it doesn't define a family. So if you have, um, and it, it, but it does also extend to uh, RVs, tent camp, tents, towed trailers, what have you. Um, so you, you could make an argument that you are, if, if it, there are four, four trailers, but it is one family, there could be an argument that it is not technically under the state sanitary code, a campground. We're saying if you have three or more, we consider it, we expect you to comply with these regulations for everyone's health and safety. Um, I think but the more we're definitive about things, the less arguing someone will have with Tommy about it, that if you have three or more campers, well, then if you have more than three campers, then you need to go and get your um, permit or at least comply with the Board of Health requirements. It's three or more families, Bill, you said? So it's three not- Three or more families or camping groups. Right. So uh, that's Which, how the, the state sanitary code defines it. Um, but for the purposes of the bylaw, we're asking if you have more than two, we would like you to comply. As right. with, um, but not family. So you need to take that out. We're, we're just talking about units. Right. In the bylaw, Three, we're talking about two. Uh, th more than two RVs require compliance with the state sanitary code, 105 right. CMR 440. We so don't- you, Mike, I think you're okay with three RVs constitute a campground. We start to get, we start to get to the family stuff. You can get into all kinds of confusion. Right. We're, we're being a bit more definitive with three or more, three or more RVs constitute a campground. Right. Might be a lot easier for everybody involved. Right. So is that still considering uh, pull behind campers or just RVs? Yep. That, that is per site. So whether it is a self-propelled RV, a towed uh, trailer, uh, it, is, it is covered. Are you the, uh, the definition in the in the sanitary code, camping unit means any vehicle or object on wheels, which is designed and uh, constructed to permit the vehicle to travel over the highway and permit the use thereof for camping purposes. Tents are also considered camping units, whether mounted on a trailer or not. But we're not, for the first two, it is, Purely the uh, building inspector's discretion. If it's three or more, the bylaw is asking you to additionally comply with the minimum standards for campgrounds. And then the other piece is that people may get confused of under the fees. We're saying if you have three, it's a hundred dollars. But if you go to four, you have to add an additional hundred. Yeah, or we can add 
if we could do a hundred for the first two and uh, and maybe uh, three or more is fifty dollars RP, something like that. If you want to, depending on how you want to uh, give people a break, it's probably not going to be that much more work for more than you know the first the first two are most of the work anyway. I would think. Right. So it's going to be a hundred dollars for the first two, and then what fifty dollars after that per camp? Traditional. That was a good good suggestion. If everybody agreed on that. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. Yep. Okay. First two, one hundred. Uh, three or more. Uh, fifty dollars per. Hello. <laughs> oh, hey, yep. Tom, Tom, Bill, uh, it's Kevin again. Um, I just wanted to, um, I did put it in the, um, in the chat. Usually um, any camper or trailer is covered by the vehicle's insurance that is towing it. Um, but it does need to be registered. But it's not like you need a separate policy for that camper unless people get it for, you know, basically, you, you know, for damage or something like that in those regards. For mm -hmm. compensation, comp, uh, comprehension, set, comprehensive. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so that uh, I read yours, and I was going to wait till we finish with that. Um, so basically, you're saying you have a vehicle um, insured to pull it out. You know, I guess. So I don't think it, we, it, exactly. Uh, right. I mean, I think that would that's still okay. We're not asking for the insurance policy, just the registration number. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying because okay. it might be confusing where people think they have to pull policies out on the campers and everything, but it is covered. As long as it's registered, it's covered under the vehicle that's towing it. Okay. I didn't realize that. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe, uh, Mike, you just want to clarify that it, uh, that the $50 is for, uh, Yeah, $50 uh, per RV. $50 per, each. Per additional. So got $50 per RV. Okay. You've got that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Bill, I wrote that too in there too. Um, with the 50. Uh, it should be something that says for each additional, you know, uh, uh, for each additional camper is $50. So $50, yeah, per, for per RV is $50. What it right. Well, you can put RV too. For each additional RV is $50. Yeah, it's fifty dollars. You don't need to put over because it's it basically you have first two a hundred dollars for each additional RV um, is fifty dollars is uh, fifty dollars. So you basically say it right there. It, it, it's it, it, there's no confusion there. That looks very good. So, so any of the other changes from last from last week? Does anybody have any comments? Anything that they do or don't like about it? Want to change? I think you guys have done a really good job. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional hands. Right. I'm sorry. Are you guys taking questions? Yes. So, sorry, just to go back to the fee structure. So basically, so if I only have one camper, no matter what, it's $100, but it's an additional 50 for each additional. So you basically you're charging each camper for $50 each, except that one camper has to pay 100. No, it's, it's two campers. You get but what if I only have one on my property? Either way, I have to pay $100. Correct. Yep. So I, as one camper, am getting paying more than the people that have two or three campers for my permit. It, it, it's it's, your, it's the overall review, and and that's why we're we were trying any way to cut it, you know, cut it down, and and you know, it's, it was the overall review is is what we we're working on. So at that point, when you get to three, it, it's a lot less work. But it still does come to fifty per camper. I understand if you know because you're paying fifty per if you if you have to. Right. So even if I have one, I still have to pay the hundred. 
So basically, I should just put two on my on my campground. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, can I interrupt for a minute? Of course. Sorry, I don't have the hand thing. Charge a hundred dollars a camper, and that's it. You go to a campground, you pay thirty to forty dollars a night. This is for a three-year permit. Right. If somebody's going to complain for thirty-three dollars a year, that's ridiculous. Just do a hundred dollars a camper. Be done with it. Right. You don't have to worry. Just do a hundred dollars a camper. Nobody's going to complain about it, right. and that way your costs are covered. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. Streamlined. Yeah, I think it's fair that way, or more fair to that way to each camper. <laughs> I agree with that. So first, just say first RV 100 every RV $100 yeah oh every RV okay yep. yeah because like I said it's a three-year permit and it's $33 a year I, I used to go camping all over and it was 34 to $50 a night for the cheaper campgrounds so that's fair enough and, and you guys are still putting the time in per camper, no matter what. So I think it would just be a, a flat rate for everybody, no matter, you know, the amount of campers would be better. Okay, so first RV 100, each additional RV 100. That sounds great. Yeah, or you could just say $100 per RV. The same permit fee, one hundred dollars. Because it doesn't matter whether you've got one or two, or are you saying the first two? Because what I heard Johnny say was that one hundred dollars per RV. Well, you know, I, I like leaving it sort of with this structure for now, because if it does turn out that it is taking a lot more work. Um, you know, just leave first RV one hundred, each additional RV one hundred. And then if it um, is turning out to be a lot more work, there's a, a space in there. It, it'll be easy to, to edit it. If, it. if it's not taking a lot of work, each additional RV can go down to 50. If it is taking, uh, you know, just leave it like that. I, I, I think that that's useful. I, I do understand what you said. Just every R, you know, yeah. Each each RV one hundred. That's good. Yeah, but yeah. and I'm glad you put the three year permit so people understand that. You know, it's a hundred dollars over three years. Mm -hmm. These are great team building seminars. <laughs> Anybody else have any more comments on it? This is Janice. Um, so are we doing anything about a definition of recreational vehicle? It's in the zoning bylaw, right? So we don't need to put it into the this permit thing. Correct. Correct. Okay. It is in the zoning bylaw. Okay, good. So do you want, um, we'll send this out to all the uh, every committee member and just over overlook and, and send anything that you notice that we might have missed and then or do you I think we can I don't know if we need to take a vote or say it looks good are you good with I'll come off of share bill and I'll save this and email it to you and then you okay oh yeah email it to Dee Dee and she has the list for everybody yeah. yeah since we didn't get a chance really to read it before the meeting it'd be nice to just look at it to give it a final blessing at the next meeting. Good job on the application, Chief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're working on it today. You should see how he's, he's good with that computer. I was very impressed. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. so this way, I think that is everything. I don't know as we need to meet again. Um, Are you going to meet to vote on it? Yeah, I mean, can, we, can we vote by email? email? How does that work, Mr. Dwyer? On this, do we... probably. You know, if, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could uh, just send the uh, sent back just to acknowledge that uh, the uh, application looks looks okay. Okay. 
I mean, technically, it's your it's your baby anyway, Tom. You are the uh, you're the guy with the discretion to design this. And I was just gonna I was just gonna run it by and make sure the uh, select board is okay with the fee because that's always run by I'll at least run it by Carolyn to mention it to them that they are okay with that fee now that we've set a set a fee. Okay. We'll send Johnny in to uh, testify that no one's going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, it's a bargain. You know, if you're paying 30 to 50 to maybe $100 a night for a site in a commercial campground somewhere, and you're getting $100 for three years for 170, well, three times 179. So that's pretty good. It comes down to pennies. Well, just think about it too. You're not towing your camper around. So mm -hmm. your carbon footprint's a lot smaller this way. You're saving the earth in the yep. same time. Okay. And I think this makes it easier because it was starting to, I think, confuse people then in getting within the Board of Health and all that then involved, which makes it then more confusing. This way, we're just talking about each trailer a fee. Then if it's three or more, then that's the Board of Health gets involved, conservation gets involved in their part. So I think that it's just better this way. I think you did, Chief, put in something about uh, other fees, maybe other boards may charge other fees. Yeah, that's correct. It, it okay. doesn't supersede the, you know, if somebody has to pull a Board of Health permit and they have a fee for their inspection that doesn't it's not included in this okay good all right so we'll we'll wait to we'll get that email out tomorrow and wait to hear back from everybody if, if they had anything else we need to discuss okay all right thanks everyone yeah thank, thank you, you all you. all right thank you guys. a lot of work thanks guys <laughs>